When did your publications, when did your writings become acceptable in the academic community? Well, I didn't really say, feel safe bringing out a lot of it until until I applied for my full professorship, really. You know, I just, uh, I could I just show you what I've got here? Let's do that. What I produced during that time. Um, this is a book called The Autobiography of Deborah Carr, C-A-R-R. And it's actually the journal of a year in my life in 1980 when I was being a teacher, a mother, a lesbian, uh, a writing. Um, so this is my car at the time, Deborah, C-A-R-R. Um, and uh, it's partly written from her point of view. But it's full of uh, pictures. I published one in handwriting, which this is, and then I I didn't actually officially publish them because these people wanted so much money for to reproduce these pictures of Deborah Carr. Uh, Deborah Carr, for people who don't know, was a movie star in the fifties and sixties. Uh, and probably most remembered for roles like Mrs. Anna and the King and I, or uh, From Here to Eternity. Um, anyway, um, she has been a kind of a, a talk about ways of solace, or uh, she has been an icon in my life for a long time. It was when I was Growing up as a teenager, I I worshipped her really, and uh, uh, was pretty obsessed with her. But also took a lot of strength from her, strength that I didn't see as such in the women in Ashland, Oregon, where I was growing up. Um, and when I became a lesbian, I kind of went back to thinking about what she had been in my life, and and she became again a huge source of inspiration for my writing. So I have written a book, which I do not have a paper manifestation of, <clears throat> called Tenderly Lesbian Meditations on Deborah Carr. Um, uh, which is in part a memoir of those teenage years and looking at her movies and remembering what they meant to me at that time and looking at them from the feminist perspective of 50 years later. Um, so, but before I wrote that, in 1980 I took this journal and wrote the autobiography of Deborah Carr. So it really matters to me that this get published again. I really want to see it out there before I'm done. I'm at that stage of my life where I'm just trying to kind of pull together my legacy of what it is that I've done. So uh, I just, these are things that I've had pieces published in a book, Our Lives, Lesbian Personal Writings, actually had a couple of pieces that were taken from here. Other Lives was a meditation on reincarnation by a bunch of us in writer's group. And Sophie's Wind was a short-lived philosophy publication that published a little bit of the De some of my Deborah Carr writing. So then also, during those years, I produced this, which is a, a book about my great-grandmother and her poetry. 
Uh, she herself had a book published by Putnam um, back in the day uh, of her sonnets. She wrote Italianate sonnets, which are really complicated sonnets. Um, but she also wrote other things, so there's some autobiographical material in here and uh, other stuff. I put this together and you, it was such a thrill in those days. We could actually make our own books. It's like for the first time in history, we didn't have to wait for somebody else to say, okay, this is a good enough book and I can make some money off of it. We could just make them. And um, there's a whole line, a couple of lines of books there, many of which are like just hand produced and just an outflowing of the of the lesbian feminist imagination. So then this is also a book I put together, this historical novel that I worked on about Christina of Sweden, uh, who lived in the 1600s and was a really interesting person, but uh, I was not able to do it and it's kind of on the back burner now. We'll see if it ever gets forward. So then, this is uh, The Womanly Art of Teaching Ethics. This is the article that I wrote about how I do my ethics classes and why I do them the way I do. I typed this up. It was like the first attempt I'd had to publish something and sent it in to Teaching Philosophy and waited and waited and waited and waited and didn't hear and didn't hear. And finally, I got an acceptance. And it turned out the guy had given it to his, this reviewer who completely believed a lot of the things I said in there, but hated feminists and feminism and didn't, so he'd set this guy this funny puzzle. And so here I was waiting, waiting, waiting to hear and, uh, but anyway, it did get published in the end and got cited twice, which is more than most uh, m most uh, articles in philosophy do. And then this is the both the paperback and the hardback versions of Adventures in Lesbian Philosophy, which is um, put out by Claudia Card. This was probably in the 90s and has several pieces of mine that have to do with philosophy all of which are going to turn up in my book, Magic and Philosophy. And then meanwhile, I had this kind of underground life as a writer of erotic stuff. Um, so these are two of the three books that T. Corinne, my, she's a, was a dear friend of mine. She was a well-known artist and as I said, a very productive writer. And she put together three anthologies of erotic writing. And so I published these under the name Pearl Times Child, which has sort of been my nom de plume of choice for all these years of her stuff that I really didn't want the school to get wind of. So, so here they are and here I am out with it. This one is called The Body of Love and this one is called Writing Desire. So and this is not self-published. We didn't, T did manage to find some presses that uh, at the time she got some work published through them. So um, so I guess that's just, I just wanted to show you what I was producing during these years and doing. I also have an article in a big set called The History, Women in, West, in Western Civilization or something like that, History of Women in Western Civilization. And I wrote the article on Queen Christina for that. So that was nice to be able to put history in that way. I really wish I'd been able to write the one on Deborah Carr, but somebody else had already written that by me and my friends, but there's a lot of them that are there. 
also some formative books for me. But you know, there were women's bookstores, there were women's concerts, there were just so much women's culture at the time. Yes, and that's my journals that go from about 77 to the present, actually. But mostly in the 70s and 80s, and after I was teaching full-time, I just couldn't keep up with uh, such extensive journal writing. And those are typed up. I did have a friend of mine. I did pay her to, to uh, type. And this is a production of... Uh, that is still viable after all these years, uh, that is actually made by Women on Land. It's a beautiful date book that has, it's, has astrology, but has plenty of room to put things in. It has wonderful art and, and writing. Uh, and it's been going since about 1983, I think. Um, and has gotten bigger and bigger. They get thousands of submissions from all over the world. Uh, so it's quite a phenomenon and supports a few women. Uh, and uh, the, what my connection with it for the past few years has been that I annually host a weekend where we do a selection circle where we sit and go through the art and read the writings and say what we think about them. So here. this here in this house and outside here, there's just women everywhere sitting around, going through folders, sitting and reading. Ever, it's all quiet. It's really a wonderful event. Uh, so that's one thing I do now. I was thinking of that question. Another thing I do now is I run a list serve for that has about 200 women on it, lesbians and their friends, and uh, it, but everything filters through me, so, but uh, it's all, it's about, you know, everything, concerts that happen, news among us, places for rent or sale, you know, just any kind of thing that would be useful for the community to know, but I think it has helped keep a community existing by having a common source that women can can uh, feed into. Oh, and I wanted to show you something else. This was made from, well, from scraps from that chair over there by my friend Gwen Morris. And on the back is a quote from this book here that she embroidered. She had a machine that does, you could program it and it does embroidery. It says, sometimes the universe gives no evidence of caring and it seems the goddess will never speak again. Never spoke. And then something happens that seems to say you've been dancing all along and that at the heart of everything is loving laughter. <laughs> so, she embroidered that for me. It was one of the sweetest presents I ever got. So, what was Ashland like growing up? I think about my grade school experiences. Uh, there were a lot kids of like farmers and and uh, loggers, of which I was one. My dad was a logger. Um, my friends had parents that owned a hardware store in one case and shoe repair shop. They're just that kind of people. They were pretty conservative and I would every now and then get crosswise of them. I remember one time I wore my aunt's um, bridesmaid a bridesmaid dress that she'd kept that had a long full skirt i just wore it to school one day because i thought it would be fun and this was in my junior high and i just learned very fast that that was not a cool thing to do and i thought it'd be cool but anyway uh so 
So things were pretty rigid in that way. On the other hand, from junior high on, I was sort of in with a bunch of girls who had gone to Briscoe School that were kind of smart and kind of proud that we didn't cheat on tests and, you know, uh, kind of, you know, good. Uh, and we had this in, uh, eighth grade teacher, Miss Foster, who was named Co Coney, was her camp Girl Scout name. And she was clearly, I found out later, she was clearly a lesbian, and I even found a little card that she sent me. I'd evidently, when I met Deborah Carr, I'd written to her about it and told her afterwards, and she wrote back, sent this card with little purple pansies on it, and said something about, oh, I'm so pleased that you knew I'd want to know that. <laughs> and so, anyway, uh, so we had this thing called Girl Scouts, which was really pretty informally Girl Scouts, but we'd go like camping up to the Apple Gate or, or hiking up here. And so during high school, we had that as well. And it was a lot of that same group of girls that were doing that. And then through one of them, actually, I also got into the Shakespeare Festival for a couple of years, uh, just doing little tiny parts, uh, you know, Fairy and Midsummer Night's Dream or Pick Curtain Page or things like that. Um, so, but that gave me a taste to a, a little bit of another world. So, but when I left, I thought, I am never coming back to that little town. You know, I wanted something more. And indeed, when I get to college, people didn't think it was so weird if I wanted to wear a cloak instead of a coat. And, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, a, a little more open. And I just thought I didn't want to come back. But then, John, my husband's first job was in Northridge in California, and so we lived there for two years, and he taught at that kind of cutthroat school there, um, and I was raising the baby at the time. Um, uh, oh dear, where was I going with that? Oh, just that living in Los Angeles. The more I lived in Los Angeles, the more beautiful Ashland looked. And and also, I grew up around my family. My grandparents had a pear orchard back of Phoenix on Carpenter Hill Road. And so I, and you know, my brothers and I would spend time out there with them. and. It just seemed to me, and my parents lived here, and and uh, I liked them quite well, and and uh, so it just seemed to me right that to to move back here. You ask about that, why I returned, and it just seemed such a good idea to to move back here, and I love the part about Ashland where you know everybody. It's I used to say it's like an Ing Ingmar Bergman movie where, you know, somebody's a gas station attendant one time and a night another time. And it's sort of, you know, my students would turn up doing all kinds of things in town. And, uh, and that was fun. And we had free babysitting of somebody who loved them, our kid and wanted to take care of them. We're talking about, uh, as a child. I was born in 1940, so essentially the 40s I was a child, the 50s I was a teenager. Okay. So when I, I left in 50, I started college in 58, in the fall of 58. Okay. Hooks writes about that. She bought a house next door to her parents and all her colleagues said, why would you do that? Why would you want to live next door to your parents? But to her, it made all the sense in the world. And I feel extremely fortunate that I was able to come back here to my hometown where I had all these ties and connections and, uh, and, uh, and live here. Oh, I remember, of course, in those days, you never heard of such a thing as homosexuality or lesbians or anything. And I remember, when I was about eight, 
these two women bought a house down here on Terrace Street from our family and we ended up buying it back later but but two women together and and it turned out one of them was a, a widow and I remember going oh you could do that when the men die then we could move in with each other and uh, so that was sort of my one exposure to the actual possibility when I was a kid and then I have a whole book about being a teenager and the only one who'd ever thought of such a thing in the world and uh, uh, you know, which it was at that time. People just did not talk about it. It not only was abominable, but it didn't exist. So, you know, and you lost all credibility if you were one. So, I have a piece about learning the word homosexual from Tea and Sympathy. I don't know if have you heard of that play. Anyway, it was a play that Deborah Carr was in that at least mentioned the word. And uh, that's where I first learned about it when I was 13. So I've got a piece about that that in my that's actually already up online uh, called "Remembering Teen Sympathy." So yeah, but it was there was just there weren't words, and it didn't exist. What were your experiences in graduate school as the first P female PhD? It was almost all men. I There was a large graduate, uh, well, a large department, there were probably eight, eight or ten men in it. One woman for a few years. I remember asking her why she measured in philosophy, if whether it, whether it was because she thought it had, had profounder truths and other stuff. And, I think she'd been in science before, and she said, no, I was better at it than I was at chemistry. So anyway, she, and then she left. So it was a sense I was always dealing with men. My classes, my graduate school classes were all men. There was one woman again for a year, and then she got pregnant and left. And so, um, and I know one graduate student who I talked to later talked about how kind of abusive that felt to her. Her family had been abusive. Her father had been abusive, uh, viol physically violent. And she talked about what fear that graduate school experience evoked in her from that. And I think I probably struggled with that the rest of my life from, you know, wh how hard that experience was. What what happened was I increasingly became silent. I just, I couldn't compete with these guys for floor space and, and uh, I was running into all the problems that I solved later by passing around an orange, you know, what I wanted to say was 10 points back or something and, and uh, so I just, sat there and listened and wrote excellent papers and got excellent grades because of that. But I also sort of ran out of ideas. I had less and less ideas. I had one thing that I wanted to write my dissertation on, and luckily that one was enough to get me through. But it's just otherwise I just couldn't. I, I, I found it harder and harder to write. Um, so it, it sort of began to came, come back when I wrote my dissertation. And then really my writing ability really came back when I started keeping a journal, which was a dream journal at first, which was in the 70s. So one thing, a memory that just came back to me uh, recently at a memorial service for one of my old teachers, is that when I was a graduate student, after I was through with everything except my dissertation, I had asked this one professor to to uh, be my dissertation, what was that called anyway, chief overseer. Uh, and um, But I was free at the time. I had just, John and I had split up and I was living by myself. And he kind of 
started an affair with me and I just the kind of thing they tell you not to do and for very good reason uh, because pretty soon I was saying that I didn't really want to do it. I mean at first I was flattered I guess but I but uh, and then he got kind of nasty and started threatening my dissertation to like uh, and so I didn't know what to do, but I had this other friend, the guy whose memorial service I just went to, who was an uh, old teacher of mine, and when I told him about what was happening, he suggested that he could be my dissertation advisor, and, and uh, you know, he asked some good questions and made it a better dissertation, and I got through and was able to have a career in philosophy. But this first guy was really putting up a roadblock by, you know, holding that power over me. So it did happen back in those days. I mean, there were no words for it. There were no rules for it. You know, I'd hear, I'd hear many times about this and that professor who slept with all the women graduate students in his career. And, that just was one of the things that happened in those days. And I'm not even against policing all relationships between people, but that definitely a pitfall. So, but also in graduate school, I sort of didn't believe the orthodoxy of the time where they were Wittgensteinians the, 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 um, not the easiest thing to say is that they were behaviorists, kind of, that language had meaning equaled what behavior you did that accompanied those words. And, and it ruined, it made metaphysics and some of the philosophical doubts completely impossible and therefore everything was wonderful according to them. But to me, philosophy has a lot to do with wonder and I don't want to really resolve those puzzles and I don't think it brings clarity to do it. I'm more sensitive to how words mean as a writer. I know something about, you know, what resonances words have and and the kinds of meanings they can have and to reduce it all to this kind of behaviorist thing that will solve all the problems in philosophy I thought was pretty awful and that was essentially what my dissertation was about. So I was kind of set loose to work on my own philosophy I think from that. That also the doll work, my writing, my career as a builder. You want to talk about the dolls? Kind of believed in dolls. Uh, was taught that it was virtue to believe that dolls were alive and secretly alive and it's part of believing in magic or just things like that that I'm I'm really interested in these kind of states of consciousness where you both believe and don't believe it's like philosophers don't look at that much it's like you either believe it or you don't and and things like, you know, reading a book or whatever, but also pretend play of every kind and, and dolls. And so I have this kind of love of showing dolls as being alive. But then also it's like you're in charge of the scenario. So like I love to make happy doll stuff where the women are kind of empowered in one way or another. I love to have little lesbian interactions of various kinds. For years I worked with Barbie dolls uh, because they were the best miniatures around, uh, essentially, and they had all this stuff. So it created the possibilities of doing all kinds of scenes, even though the dolls were not all that great, but the wardrobes were wonderful. And uh, uh, so I worked with that until sometime in the 2000s, I think, when I, 
when I found out about these smaller scale dollhouse dolls that are called Heidi Ott dolls. They're made in Switzerland and they're very poseable. They have charming faces and uh, they just, before that, I just, I, I knew that there was all this good stuff made in the 112 scale, but the dolls were just impossible. They were stiff and not poseable at all. And so, um, but, but once that opened up, I kind of moved into this smaller scale. So now I, for a long while, I worked on little stories and vignettes having to do with the life of these two older, it's called Boston Marriage, and these two older women move into the dollhouse together, and then there's two younger women who help them out and gradually also move in, and so they build an addition, and there's little stories from their lives, little stuff, but I love to photograph them just to create the feeling that they are alive, that they become characters. And I think for me, playing with dolls is so elementary. It's back there such a long ways in my, I grew up playing with dolls and, you know, reading the Raggedy Ann stories and believing in dolls. And, and so I, love the illusion that they're alive and it is worth a lot of work to me to actually be able to create the feeling that these little beings exist and have these lives. So, um, so I, for a long time I did this Victorian dollhouse and actually the key was I read a novel that was set in suffrage times and they were in the attic the do kids were in the attic sewing these banners that said votes for women and I thought that would be so cool for a dollhouse that uh, they have tiny sewing machines and stuff like that and you know rather than replicating the standard family I wanted to do something completely different with the with the medium of dolls and so there's there's the Boston Marriage Dollhouse, which is set in about 1868 or 1870, something like that. So when they want to actually live in it, it turns into one house. This part I bought and this part I made. Now I have also a modern dyke doll house, I call it, that just with, so I can use some modern stuff and have some modern things happening. End of a long dirt road out in the country. Oh. Why is it called a dyke doll house? Because it's lived in by two country dykes from the 80s. And since they live way out in the woods, they don't have to worry about clothes if they don't want to in the summertime. So they've had this cabin forever, and then fairly recently, a couple of years ago, I built this in here so they could have a writing annex where they could go to work. So on they have a little rainbow flyer thing, and they've had, over the years, various yard signs that said no on 13 and no on 8, and all the various things that we've had to try to outlaw teachers from teaching about homosexuality and stuff like that. So they, they have a little set of women's spirit magazines and a copy of T's Yantras of Woman Love, which are erotic photography. Oh, I'm 
kind of documenting the culture of the country dykes of the 70s and 80s who lived out in the ro on the ends of dirt roads on women's land. So I, I read um, your piece about how your dolls became alive as a child. Yes. When did you start putting together the, the context for the dolls? When did you start creating the scenes? Creating the scenes? Well, I did a whole lot more since I retired. It's like I was just tired of talking almost, you know, I just, it was nice to just go into a medium that was completely different than that. And, and, uh, but, but I started doing Celine, the greatest bull leaper on earth, uh, which is a 30 minute story uh, set back in ancient Greece and ancient Crete. Um, done by Barbie dolls and my daughter and I started that back in 1978 from a book that Z Budapest wrote uh, that had that story in it and we had always kind of liked to take Barbie dolls and act out stories together we'd done various stories and and we thought oh, it would be fun to have little bull leapers and so we made little bull leaper costumes and stuff and then we liked what we'd done so much, we ended up going to the beach, and she was like eight years old at the time, and uh, staying overnight and doing a photography shoot with some of it. And that was kind of the beginning. So that would be like 70, 76. Uh, and then it went on, uh, off and on, for like 20 years, that various people helped me with it. Marcella helped me, my daughter helped me with it several times, then my niece, then one of my assistants in the summertime, uh, that we got very elaborate with some of the scenes. And uh, and uh, so for a couple of summers, actually, we shot, we had a big table set up here on the deck and tried to shoot before the dolls got too hot and fell, all fell over. and. And uh, so it was a big production that went on for quite a few years of my life. But to me, the thing is I couldn't really use it because Mattel was standing there in the way. Uh, so, but ideally I would have loved to show it to children because the Barbie at the time, what her life was supposed to be, was so different from the life I could imagine Barbies living. So I really wanted them to have better lives. I just, uh, so, um, so this was a way to do that and to kind of model for little girls. And ancient Creed was able to both be this sort of symbol of feminism and at the same time, make way for big busty Barbies with lots of eye makeup and that kind of thing which comes so naturally to Barbies and uh, so it was it was just a really fun project to do. Um, and, and your work with dolls has ranged from play, uh, the Nutcracker series for example. Yes, that's right. To, to more political and more uh, radical feminist. So was there was there an arc to that narrative? No. Or it was just as you felt at the time? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The Nutcracker was kind of a regression, but I just had all those great costumes that I'd always wanted to put it on. And if I go on, there's part two of the Nutcracker, and I could have the Nutcracker turn into a woman and have a more interesting. I was working with a little girl, and her frame of reference was heterosexual and a male Nutcracker, and he was quite a charming Nutcracker. So uh, I don't know if I'll ever finish that, but yeah. I kind of like to. I've got all the costumes. But talk about Sunday morning. Sunday morning was, well, my friend T. Corinne, who wrote the erotic books and did lots of photography, including erotic photography, um, uh, she 
have found at a garage sale or something the Barbie that has the sort of big hair that's tied back and T, she, she had a soft cloth body and T made her a kimono. And, uh, and then I had this other doll, a Rosie O'Donnell doll who just looked a lot like T actually. And so I just thought it would be sweet to make a little tribute to you know how nice it is to get up in the morning with somebody you've had a good time with the night before and uh, oh and I had this wonderful kitchen set at the time that I wanted to use. Pink. Well not entirely pink. There was some more pink that I would like. Uh, you know Barbies at first were not pink and that became something they did afterwards but you know they were like real colors uh, you know like a typewriter was gray and green keys and it was not pink so um, so I, I've, I've always hated that pink aspect or not I don't hate pink but I, but they really ever did it with the Barbies so uh, my question about the dolls um, you've you controlled your environment you played you uh, expressed your femininity in all of its forms. Was there ever a time when you used the dolls to express a fear or a negative emotion? No. No, I like doll play to be reassuring and positive and there's, I just feel like there's not enough positivity in the world and I don't actually like it when people like create haunted houses with dolls or use doll baby parts, my God, to do some bizarre thing or Barbies. They, people have done all kinds of weird stu art stuff with Barbies and Mattel proves that but not my sweet little story. Where did those thoughts for you go? Where, where, where did those fears and those negative thoughts go? Do they go to your journals? Oh, some. I smoke them away a lot. Okay. <laughs> I really, uh, I don't live in a lot of fear. I guess, or yeah, I don't have a lot of anger. I mean, I lived a pretty good life, you know. I I can get mad at people for sure, but but um, you know, I wasn't abused as a child. I didn't even, you know, hate my husband for most of the reasons that people do, you know. I uh, though I did have a hard time getting the floor with him. But <laughs> but that's typical, isn't it? This one opens up. So that's one set. You know, people don't take dollhouse work seriously. Uh, it's hard. To, there's a kind of a scorn about it. Like uh, you don't. You're supposed to lose interest in that when you grow up. So anyway, here are four little girls live with Miss Clavel, who is over here visiting the horses.
dolls, especially at the time that I did the Celine work and the Barbie dolls and, you know, the image of Barbies at the time and what I wanted to do with them, is that to me, Barbies were kind of like a language that a whole bunch of little girls and women had spoken in their life. And I thought it would be a trip for them to see these dolls speaking in a whole other language, which has to do with feminism and uh, empowerment for girls and magic and stuff like that. Thank you for your story. Oh, Thank you're you welcome. Your Thank you for asking. Nobody's ever asked. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been kind of wonderful to go back and revisit it and think about it again and think about the people who helped me and just lots of things.